Wine. My name is Matt Parolo. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary, and I'm so glad to be with you today. We are in for a really great message, a really great service this weekend. But first, we need to highlight and celebrate just how amazing it was last weekend for Vision Weekend with Pastor Skip. And one of the things that we unpacked was God's plan, His vision to make more room. Now, we had been in a series that took about eight weeks to finish, and it was a series called In the Room, and it was all about the things that you only get when you're in the room. In the room, we connect. In the room, we have corporate worship. And I talked about this last week, actually. One of the most beautiful things about worship is getting to see the people that you're standing alongside, the people that are sitting on the other couch aside from you. And so we're going to do a little bit of a recap from Vision last week, right now. And then Janae's going to join me, and it's going to be a great time. Never mind, I'm just getting a cue that that recap video is not available. We're having some technical issues. So would you help me welcome the one, the only, Janae Heitzig to this pre-service segment. Whoops. Sorry, Janae, guys. we're happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> we were just talking about how great the series In the Room has been. Yes. And the fact that we wrapped it up last week with this pillar, this this capstone of a message saying we want to make more room. We right. want to start locations, meeting, gathering places all across the world. Right. 12 of them by the end of the, these 12 months, 2024. So absolutely incredible. One of the things that we had asked was uh, what watch parties are you guys wanting to start and where are watch parties starting? And so we have six cities that we're excited to announce our starting watch wow. parties in the next few weeks. And you could start gathering together with them. So do you wanna, you, should we do like a little oh, drum roll Trump. thing? Oh. Who do we think ah, is number six? Port Orchard, Washington whoop, whoop, whoop. is getting a watch party. I have to be honest, I didn't know there was a place called Port Orchard. But now we do. But now we do. We see you. And it and sounds like a lovely place. It. It, it does. Port sound, Orchard? It don't you feel like, like it's rain? It, beautiful just greenery. Lush yeah. fruit and life. Yes. I want that. Let us know if you're in Washington. We're going to come to Port, Port Orchard. Orchard. Next, we want to no, come. We would but like we also want to know what it's like there. That's for sure. Yeah. And we may not have known that it existed, but we're never going to forget it now. That's right. So where else are we launching a watch party? Fayetteville, North Carolina. North Carolina. What do you think the people in Fayetteville are doing right now? Fayetteville. Fayetteville. I don't know. They're Saying hey. Probably enjoying <laughs> a great springtime humidity. Do we do you think, think it's hot Do you think it was humid there? yet? I don't, I don't know. Not yet. I don't probably feel like it's not. not hot yet. It's always probably humid. Yeah. You can correct us if we're wrong, obviously. Please tell us. We need to spend more time around the United States. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> We've also got Parkland, Florida, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Colorado. Springs. But, All but, of these are just gorgeous locations. Ogden, Utah. Ogden. Ogden. That's got to be that's got to be a pretty rad location. Yes. And then Lakewood, Colorado. So two Colorado watch parties that are launching here in the next few weeks. Hey, if you heard any of those cities and thought, wow, I live, I live Near nearby. There. Yeah. Well, you can find those locations. You can find those watch parties on our website. We would love to get you in touch. That way you can watch party together. Woo -woo. Hey, Janae, what do we got going on for service today? Who's teaching? My wonderful husband is going to be teaching, um, talking about wins and losses yep. through the eyes of Elijah, just how to turn those L's into W's. And so I'm excited. He yeah. always motivates me and encourages me. So I'm excited so to hear what's going on in First Kings. So good, so good. Hey, one of the things we were just talking about is obviously all those watch parties that we're starting and different locations that we're starting across the world. But maybe you go onto our website, calvarynm.church slash locations. Let me say that again for those who didn't hear me the first time, <laughs> calvarynm.church <laughs> slash locations. If you go there and you're like, man, none of these cities are near me, suggest your yes. city. We would love to bring a campus to a neighborhood near you. Yeah. And so if you gather together with a few friends already or say, hey, wait, I've got friends that love Jesus. Let's watch church together. Absolutely. They, and call around. Call yeah. your friends. If you, you're interested, call your friends, start something going, and then look on our web and get more so information. Good. And we'll be there to connect with you. We would love to get resources in your hands and help you guys get that going. So good. Hey, well, as one series closes, another one opens. I'm really excited for this one. All right, well, I tell us like about it then. I don't even, well, we're going to be studying in the book of James. I love James. Um, not to mention, it's all about adulting. And yes. I feel like 
that's what we're calling it, adulting. But it's just, sometimes it's hard to be an adult yeah. and it takes a lot of responsibility. And I feel like this next generation needs to kind of understand what they're they're walking into. Mm. Um, sometimes they think they can kind of push things off and yeah. not prioritize things. Um, but that's not what the Bible tells us to do. And so yeah. I think it's going to be really great for every generation, yeah. kind of just get a retake yeah. on what God has called us to and to yeah. continuously call yourself up, even right. if you're doing things right, even yeah. if you're doing um, what the Lord's called you to do, try to take it up a notch. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there's there's this reality that with our physical, you know, existence that we may get older, but that doesn't always mean we get more mature. Right. And spiritually, the same thing can happen is where it's like, man, I gave my life to the Lord. 40 years ago, yeah. but I'm still a spiritual toddler. Mm, and the book of James yes. is like, here's how you grow up. And so whatever yep. stage or age you're in spiritually, this is going to be such a great series. And it all kicks off next weekend with Pastor Skip, the book of James. But I've got a little bit of trivia. All right. You didn't know I was going to do this. I didn't. And so I'm nervous, guys. So I've got some <laughs> adulting questions for you. Are these opinions? <laughs> no, there's there are, these are correct answers. So your fridge is completely bare. And you guys chime in. You tell me what you think the right answers are for these. Your fridge is completely bare. It's about time you head to the store to balance out your diet. What is not one of the five food groups? A, fruits. B, dairy. C, protein. Or D, dessert. What is not a part of my what's, shopping list? No, what's not a part of the five food groups? Oh, five not food your, yeah. Oh, dessert. Okay, okay, well, uh, hey. Sorry. You're that, more of an any, adult than we maybe <laughs> thought. <laughs> Let's be real. You would have said number one food group is dessert. Yeah. Oh, I think that has the biggest the sweet only, tooth ever. It's true. I love sweets. <laughs> this is true. Uh, it's the only food group. You have a load of whites to do. At mm -hmm. what temperature should you wash them? A, 250 degrees Ooh. Fahrenheit, B, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, C, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or D, 130 degrees Fahrenheit? 130. 130? I, I don't know. Ding, 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 Oh, yeah, ding. look at me go. Janae, you are two for two. <laughs> Looks like I do uh, shopping and laundry so Shopping far. <laughs> and laundry, all right. Let's see if you can deal with cars. Oh. When it rains, it pours. Your battery just died. What do you need to jump your car? Oh, jumper cables. Jumper, okay, wow, you're just, man. You were just, you I'm didn't even it. give, you just answered it I without answered even. It. Right. I didn't even need to. All right, awesome. You have leftovers and you won't have to cook tomorrow. Yes. But how long can you keep leftovers in the fridge? A, three to seven days. B, one day. C, 10 to 14 days. Or D, seven to 10 days. I would say three to seven. Wow, you are the ultimate adult. <laughs> I just, things start going a little sour after yeah. after a week. I mean, if you don't consume it within a week, mm -mm. That's good, because this is a question. This is how I've always known whether or not like I am an adult, is number one, how long can I use these leftovers? And number two, how much time should I put on the microwave for any given item? Hmm. It's like, do you ever ask, <laughs> yes. you're just like, oh man, we're reheating this potato. Yes. How much time it goes on the well, microwave? Well, sometimes it's, it's hard like, with the microwave because it's like you're reheating soup and you're like, but is it a, is it cream based? Is it broth based? It's because all, I feel like knows, one cooks right? faster than the other. Yeah. And then it will say casserole. I'm like, what kind of casserole? That's yeah. so general. You know what <laughs> is our microwaves make it so easy for us because they literally have pictures of all the different <laughs> right. things. And I never use that. I just stick some food in there and I'm like, hmm, 15 minutes sounds right to me. <laughs> or, or, or like, 15 uh, minutes. He just recooked his whole meal. <laughs> probably 15 seconds is fine. <laughs> like, this is how I feel you're mature and you're an adult, is if you know the right number for any given item in the microwave. Okay. So, hey, we've got service starting here <laughs> in just a bit. Like Janae said, Pastor Nate is going to be teaching this weekend. It's always a treat when he does. First Kings 19. So grab your Bibles, yes. mark them, because we're going to get in there. Grab your notebook and a pen. Before we do that, obviously, we've got worship just like we do every week. And we've got a new video that we're really excited to share with you to lead us in to worship. So that's going to start in just a second. But right now, invite a friend. Click that share button. Text a friend. Let them know that they can tune in and their life might just change. Let's watch this video as we get ready to worship.
Preaching, teaching, is an embodied act. It is an in-the-flesh experience. So as we gather to worship, you're saying, God, I love you enough to listen to your word next to your people. Jesus promised he would build his church. And ever since the Holy Spirit descended on a room full of believers on the day of Pentecost, the church has been growing as it meets together in rooms around the world. We meet to learn and understand the word of God. To love and care for one another. to worship Jesus Christ together, to break bread together, to pray for hope and healing together. It all happens in the room. I love weekends because I get to worship God with others. And because I get to hear the name of Jesus Christ lifted up in those songs. I love weekends because my family gets to hear the word of God. And I have discovered that even one verse of scripture has the possibility of changing a life. I love weekends because it breaks me out of my isolation and surrounds me with godly conversations. I love weekends because I've discovered I'm a much better person in a community than I am alone. That God was right when he said, it is not good that man should be alone. I love weekends because it's a day it's a time I get to serve God's people. I get to serve with God's people. I get to invest money into the kingdom. I love weekends because often on weekends, some people surrender their lives to Jesus Christ for the first time, and I know they're going to wake up a different person Monday morning. Finally, I love weekends because I love you. And weekends is what brings us all together. Happy faces smile to see you. Friends wait to pray with you. There's always room for you. When you walk in the room, you know you're home. together in the room, our worship touches heaven. Welcome Calvary Church, Calvary Church Online, everybody outside, come on, let's stand up here, we're going to worship Jesus today. Yeah. Come on, you know this, let's sing this out together. One drink into the night, wanting a place to hide. This weary soul, this backbone. And I've tried with all my might 
But I just came in the fire I'm slowly drifting A vagabond Come on, and just when I And just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me that I was not
Whoa! 
God of Jacob, great I am, King of angels, Son of man, voice of many waters, song of heaven's throne, louder than the thunder.
church, I love singing, Hail, Hail, Lion of Judah. Isaiah chapter six is this beautiful moment. We're gonna keep singing that song in a moment. We'll continue in that chorus. But Isaiah chapter six is this amazing moment where the prophet Isaiah gets taken up to see Jesus on the throne. And we know that it was Jesus because later in John chapter 14, we're not gonna get at all of the context, but the author John writes that he who Isaiah saw was this, Jesus. So Isaiah chapter six says this, in the year, of great pain in the year when King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord seated on the throne. And what's beautiful about this is Uzziah was a good king and Isaiah was grieving the loss. The nation of Israel was in a moment of grief because who they thought was king had died. And it's like the Lord was saying in this moment, the true king has never left his throne ever. And so you might find yourself in great pain and great difficulty, and we're not supposed to just shirk that aside and say, that doesn't matter because Jesus is still on the throne, but we do need the reality check that no matter what we face, no matter what pain or difficulty or death we face, there is a king that will never vacate his throne, has been on his throne forever, and will be on his throne forever. And furthermore, he hates death so much that he came to do something about it, and he's coming back again, not as a suffering lamb, but as a roaring lion, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, and and every king that has ever lived and every emperor who ever thought he was anything is gonna declare that Jesus is King of Kings, that Jesus is Lord of Lords. So we're gonna declare that here now as well. Hail, hail, hail the Lion of Judah. Good morning, Calvary Church Online. My name is Matt and this is Janae. Hey. It's gonna be a great weekend here at Calvary in just a moment. Pastor Nate, Janae's husband, is going to be teaching from 1 Kings 19 on Elijah turning L's into W's, losses into wins. But if you're new here, we would love to hear from you and connect with you. And we have a gift right. for you. So let us know that you're new by clicking Get Connected or you can just hop in the chat area and tell our friends, I'm new. Yes, we also love to celebrate life change here at Calvary, and we believe that Jesus can change everything for you. Yes. This last month, we were able to see 53 people go public with their faith by being baptized across all of our campuses. Yeah. And we have another baptism coming up April 27th and 28th. Yeah. So if you are able to make it down to one of our campuses in person, make sure that you reg register, register, register. <laughs> register to get baptized by going online at calvarynm.church. And if by chance you can't make it in person, no worries. We would love to encourage you mm. to get baptized by a Christian friend, yeah. somebody in your community. And you can take photos or take a video and we would love to see it and celebrate with you. Yeah, so good. You know, last weekend was incredible. It was what we call Vision Weekend. And we got to hear God's heart 
about making more room. Mm. We've been in this series that we just wrapped up actually called In the Room and how important it is to get in the room with other believers, whether that's at one of our physical in-person campuses or in the room at your living room yeah. or at a board room where you can get together with others. And we also introduced this goal of launching 12 campuses by the end of 2024. We'd love to bring a Calvary campus to your city or your neighborhood. Just let us know if you're interested or if you would like to be kept up to date on any un upcoming campuses. Go to calvarynm.church slash locations. And then announcement for all the ladies. I want I want to invite you to our women's ministry spring gathering. Mm. Sheology is getting together on Friday, April 19th, so just in less than a week, for worship and a word from 80 Camp and a specialized workshop to help you grow in many different areas of your life. Mm. So you can find out more by going uh, to sheology.com and you can get your tickets there as well. Yeah, so good. Hey, we're looking forward to starting a new series next weekend with Pastor Skip through the book of James. We're calling it Adulting. We and need it. <laughs> that book is all about growing up spiritually. Uh, maybe you'll find there are things that in your, your life you're like, oh man, I've got to do like 17 cycles of laundry this week. Hashtag adulting. That's kind of the theme and the motif we're going with. I have a mountain with. of laundry. You have a mountain of laundry. Always. Oh, if we don't do at least a load every day, we start drowning in no, it. No, that's but we've where got I'm four at. kiddos. So, <laughs> anyways, yes, the book of James also has a high emphasis on prayer. So, whatever you might be going through, maybe something is a wonderful, and you'd love to celebrate that, mm. or maybe you're going through a difficult time. We would love to stand with you in mm -hmm. prayer. So, if you can, let our team online know by submitting your prayer request, or you can always go online to calvarynm.church and submit your prayer request throughout the week. Yeah, as a reminder, part of our weekly worship is giving. Some people like to set up recurring giving so that it auto drafts from their account each week, while others like to experience the act of praying over their offering or their tithe while they push that give button. Either that's way, cool. you can find those opportunities. Yeah, I yeah. heard somebody tell me a story that that's what they do. And I thought that's just such a beautiful act. Yes. But either way, you can find those opportunities <laughs> in the top right corner of our website, calvarynm.church. You can find your way back to your seat. It's a good day to be in church, isn't it, Calvary? Yeah. How good was worship? I love that new intro that our team put together. I was watching that uh, new call to worship pre-roll last night and I was just marveling at, wow, we get to be a part of this church and see the life change that happens all across the globe. Uh, wanna pause and take a moment and ask you to please be in prayer for the Rose family. By now, uh, as many of you know and have heard, Carrie's been struggling for many months uh, with health problems. And last night uh, at about 11 o'clock, Carrie went home to be with Jesus, Carrie Rose. Uh, dear friend, pastor, means so much to this congregation, uh, like a family member for so many of us and ministered uniquely to so many of us. Um, and, and of course, Pastor Chip Lusco, uh, just a little over a week ago, also went home to be with the Lord. And so it feels like a heavy season, and yet we just celebrated Easter, and we were reminded that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and that all those who call Call upon his name and who believe in him will maybe taste death, death physically, but spiritually will experience resurrection power. And so while we mourn, we're reminded that Pastor Kerry, Pastor Chip, they're more alive now than ever before, free of all that would hinder them, sickness, pain, tears. And uh, they both loved the Lord so much. They both loved this church so much. And so it's a privilege for us to be able to gather together and study the word of God that they so dearly loved themselves. But please be in prayer for Penny Rose, for uh, Aaron, for Christian, for Ryan. Our hearts are with them, so please keep them in prayer. Hey, would you help me welcome right now all of our multi-site campuses who are joining us, Santa Fe, West Side Campus, our satellite campuses in Cape Town, South Africa, Great Malvern, England, our watch parties all around the country, and of course, one more time to make you clap again, Calvary Church Online. We're so excited that all of you are here joining us today. 
Will you turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19? We're gonna be looking at verses one through 13 this weekend. Again, next week, we're starting the book of James as we get to hear from Coach Jim. I hope you saw that connection, Jim, James, Coach Jim, Coach James, on how we can be adults. I see a few of you didn't, and now you do. Um, we're excited for that series. My dad's in Poland this week with the Franklin Graham Crusade, teaching pastors how to study and teach the Bible, so pray for them. But we're gonna be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses one through 13 for a message that I've titled, How to Turn Your L's Into Dubs. Um, and I'll, if you don't get that, you don't understand what those abbreviations are, I'll explain it in a bit. Hey, who in here is a gamer? Any video gamers in the house? You like playing video games? In Madden, Call of Duty, Fortnite? Maybe we go back further, Mario? Any Mario fans in the house? <laughs> Maybe we gotta go back a little bit further. Any Pong fans in the house? You're like, just give me that one joystick. That's all, I don't want the buttons, just one joystick. Um, my son and I love playing video games together. It's one of the things that we love to connect on. He is much better than I am. There really is a generational gap there. I, he just gets it, he's just really good at it. Doesn't matter what video game you play, there's times when you play certain video games that it looks like there's no way that you can win, right? As a matter of fact, back in like the old days of video games, there wasn't YouTube videos to watch. You would have to get to a part that was hard and just spend like 12 hours figuring it out to get through it. There's just certain games that you feel like you can't win. There are certain games that it feels like there's nothing you can do to get that W. When you're facing Bowser at the very end and all you have is little Mario. You don't have any mushroom power. You don't have any fire power. It's just little Mario. When you're playing Madden and you're down 31 to zero at half. When you're the last member of your team in Fortnite and there's five teams left. When you keep getting spawn killed in COD, TDM and you're one death away from defeat. If you don't understand what that means, ask your kids or your grandkids, they'll tell you. But I've learned that no matter how much it looks like you're about to get the L, you can always turn your L's into dubs. You can always turn your losses into wins. Now let me ask you this question. Have you ever faced a situation in life that it looks like there's no way out of? It looks like there's no win to be had. Life can be a lot like video games. Sometimes in life, we can be faced with a situation that it feels like you're just a mushroomless Mario facing a fiery Bowser. A situation that looks like certain defeat, a circumstance that seems impossible to get past, a day that all the odds in life seem stacked against you, a season of loss and of pain. Has anyone ever experienced these kind of seasons and circumstances where you say, I, I can't possibly see a win in this situation. I can't possibly see a way out. I can't possibly see myself getting a W. All I see are L's. L's. But something I was reminded of this week by our youth pastor is two L's make a dub. <laughs> let me ask you another question. Honestly, have you ever felt like God has let you down? Has it ever seemed like he was just too busy to care about your needs? Or maybe you even felt guilty asking God to focus on your needs because you look at what's happening in the world to others and you're like, their issues are so much bigger than mine. There's no way God cares about my little problems. If you've ever felt like that, then you're gonna find that what God did for a person that felt very much the same way as that in our story before us can be of help to you today. This is the story of a man who was in a situation that looked like a certain loss, but he sought the Lord and he turned his L into a W, but it didn't come the way that he thought it would. The reality is we all experience pain and loss, but how we respond to the pain and loss that we experience in life, that determines our legacy. There are lessons in pain and loss that can only be learned there. For one thing, God will often reveal himself to us in a very unique way and a very special way in the midst of pain and loss. Be honest, in your life, can you not look back and say that in the times of pain and loss, you experience God in a way that you never could on the mountaintops? The closeness of the Lord, the comfort of the Lord. You get a sense of God that you can't possibly experience when you're winning or succeeding, but in pain and loss, you get a unique encounter with the Lord. We as Christians are not victims of chance. 
hoping that our luck will be good or that our luck won't run out. As God led men and women in scripture, God wants to lead us. And the Bible's full of stories of God turning L's into W's. A woman named Hannah is unable to have a child. She prays, and a baby named Samuel is born, a baby who would one day become one of Israel's greatest prophets. Samson prays, and in spite of his previous disobedience, God gives him his strength back. Paul and Silas, imprisoned for their faith, pray, and in moments, an earthquake comes, and they're free. Peter is imprisoned. The church prays, and in hours, he is released. Elijah prays. Rain stops. He prays again. It starts. He prays even again, and fire comes down from heaven. All these situations in Scripture of God taking seemingly hopeless situations and turning L's into W's. And we think, well... That can't happen to me. These are the great super spiritual, the great men and women in the hall of faith that are in the Bible. They were super spiritual. But what does James 5.17 say of Elijah? It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. I love how specific the Bible is. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. So if it's not us, it must be what we're doing. Now before we look at our text, let's first catch up with the latest adventures of Elijah. Right after the miracle of the fire coming down from heaven and the prophets of Baal being burnt up, all the people cried out, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah fell on his knees and he prayed. God had shown him that now after the people had turned from their sin and back to him, the rain would return. And he knew that a storm was coming, so he sent his servant to go check, and no storm came. He did this seven times, and finally the servant said, there is a cloud about the size of a man's hand, so pretty small, rising up out of the sea. But that's all Elijah needed to hear. He's like, all right, the storm is coming. God's on the move. And so he said to King Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And after this announcement of the coming storm, Elijah, supernaturally empowered by the Lord, ran so fast that he literally passed Ahab in his chariot and he kept that pace for 20 miles. Move over Hussein Bolt, right? I mean, he was cooking. Ahab quickly rushed home, told his wicked wife Jezebel of Elijah's exploits, of what happened. No doubt Jezebel had been waiting with bated breath to hear the news that the prophets of Baal had finally killed that pesky prophet Elijah. And that's where our story begins as we meet the opposition. And we see the first step to turn your L's into dubs is to stop the ops. Now, I'm gonna give you guys a little grammar lesson in Gen Z language because I've recently been schooled on this by my son. For weeks, my son was always saying, why are you being the ops? You gotta stop being the ops. You're always the ops. And using this term, I'm like, what is ops? What does that mean? What are you talking about? It's actually pretty simple. Ops is simply short for opposition or opponents. Anything that is against you or that you're in competition against. So next time your kid says, why are you being the ops? Now you know what they mean and you can bust them for it. (laughs) The first step we see into turning your L's into dubs is that you gotta stop the ops. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 19 verses one through 13 together. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them tomorrow by this time. Basically, I'm gonna kill you with a sword. (laughs) And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. He was tired, right? 
And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Let's stop there. Here we meet in the first part of this text our chief opponent of the story. We meet Jezebel. Now, when Jezebel heard the news that Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal, she put out a contract on Elijah's head. She would have him murdered within 24 hours. Why? It's really simple. And as a matter of fact, the spirit of Jezebel is still very present in society today and opposes Christians and God at every turn. Why? Because evil cannot tolerate righteousness. Death always attempts to destroy life. Hatred is set against love. Light is against darkness. But in Jezebel's blindness, she failed to see one very important thing. And church, this is so encouraging for you and I. When we face the world, when this Jezebel spirit that is very present in the world, I don't use that in some mystical way like a lot of preachers do. The, I'm gonna cast the Jezebel spirit out of you. It's just a very real reality. The Jezebel spirit in society that is hostile towards God, his people, and his word, and is at enmity with God, his people, and his word. This is what she didn't realize, and this is what the world doesn't realize. Their fight is with God, not Elijah. Their fight is with God, not you. It's not a battle of flesh and blood. It's a battle of spirits and principalities. As Jesus said to Saul, who was persecuting the Christians, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The fight, the battle, it's not against us. It's against God. And inversely, that means that Jezebel wasn't Elijah's opponent. She's God's opponent. Remind yourself of that when you face persecution. Remind yourself of that when you see what's happening in society and in the world. These people, these ideologies, these worldviews, they're not your opponent, they're God's opponent. They are fighting the Lord. They are wrestling against God. I think this is so important for us to realize and remember, when we stop seeing the world as our opponent, and start realizing they're God's opponent, we can go into it not trying to fight them, but trying to preach to them, to love them, to bring them into the kingdom and recognizing, hey, the fighting, God's gonna take care of that. Hey, the judgment, hey, the vengeance, God's gonna take care of that because they're God's opponent, not my opponent. But in the end, this proved to be Jezebel's own destruction. Later, Elijah told her that she would be eaten by dogs. Why? Because there was no king like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And that's exactly what happened. Jezebel was indeed eaten by dogs. And I wanna point this out. This is really specifically about Jezebel and, and her confrontation with Elijah, the fact that she attacked God and Elijah. Sin will take its toll in every life. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. I wanna ask you a question. This Jezebel concept, this idea, are you having an ungodly influence in somebody else's life? Are you dragging down or holding back someone spiritually? 
Are you keeping someone from coming to Christ by your witness or misrepresentation of God? Are you weakening the faith of some young believer? See, sometimes the opposition that we face, sometimes the ops that we need to stop aren't just external, they're internal. Sometimes the opposition, and honestly, in the Christian life, the first one that we have to deal with and fight against and stop is ourselves. And to stop the ops means stopping ourselves. It means dying to ourselves. It means putting to death the sin nature and living a new life in Christ. So we see the opposition, Jezebel, sin. Let's look at Elijah's second opponent. And this is really the chief one that Elijah faces. Although he thinks that the opposition is external, the real opposition, the real opponent is fear and doubt. Look at verse three. When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And look at verse four at the end. And he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. When Elijah hears, hears this threat from Jezebel, he is terrified. And I think that we can look at this two ways. One, if somebody threatened my life and said I was going to be dead by a sword in 24 hours, I'd be pretty scared. And yet, I've never seen fire consume prophets of Baal on a mountain. Literally like 24 hours before this, Elijah just saw the greatest miracle that many of us could ever imagine. Literally, he's experienced God at every turn. Rain stops, rain starts. Prophets are getting a little feisty. Fire from heaven. We've got some Baal barbecue going on on the mountain. He's seen some incredible things. He's seen God work miracles, things that you and I would say, if I could only see that, I would never doubt God. I would never not trust him. And yet, so quickly after these incredible things, the same courageous, fearless man who boldly stormed into Ahab's and Jezebel courts and gave the word of God, the same man who single-handedly faced down those prophets who just saw a literal representation that God was all-powerful, doubts, fears, so much so that he asks for suicide by divinity. Lord, just kill me. Just take my life. Just end it. I think this is so relatable, isn't it? It's so relatable because our memories are so short. We see God work. We see God do incredible things. And we tell ourselves, Lord, if you just do this, I'll never doubt you again. And then it works out and God does it. And, and all too later, we doubt again, right? Not too much time goes by and we can't trust. We can't see the future. We can't see what God is going to do. And I want you to know if you've ever felt that way, you're not alone. Times of greatest temptation often follow times of greatest triumph. When you think of David, Two other names come to mind, David and Goliath, and David and Bathsheba, right? One represents David's greatest victory. The other represents his greatest defeat. One, his greatest moment of faith. The other, his greatest moment of failure. Right after the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and a dove flew over Jesus at baptism, the devil was there from the dove to the devil. The devil always opposes those who God approves. Those who are obedient, who are faithful to God, become the biggest targets of Satan. See, God wants to turn your L's into W's, but Satan wants to turn your W's into L's. Satan would love you to experience God moving and get you, get your mind off of what God wants to continue to do, get you to not focus on it, get you to feel a little bit prideful, a little bit haughty, so that he can knock you down from that pedestal and bring losses into your life. Many times in our lives, the most difficult trials come after the greatest triumphs. Again, after the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountaintop came a demon-possessed man, demon man at the bottom. David, after slaying Goliath, was met with praises from the people and a spear from Saul. Samson, after destroying a thousand enemies, met a girl named Delilah. 
Peter who boldly stood for Christ and even hacked the ear off of a soldier only hours later was ashamed to even acknowledge Jesus. No sooner had Israel been delivered from Egypt than Pharaoh came pursuing them with his army. No sooner had Paul had an abundance of revelations than he was hit with a thorn in the flesh by a messenger of Satan. Sometimes our wins can cause us to feel invincible and we can let our guard down. What a perfect picture that is of the Christian life, isn't it? On the one hand, you give your life to Christ and you don't have many of the problems that you used to have, such as the guilt of sin, the loneliness, the fear of death, and yet at the same time, you face new problems because Satan will do his best to make you give up, to despair, to give in to hopelessness. He'll come and suggest all sorts of things which we'll be unable to answer. He'll come and say that the case is hopeless. He'll come and suggest that you've sinned too greatly, that you've sunk too low, that you're in a pit that you can never get out of. But Jesus, in essence, says, you've made it this far. Don't quit. Keep on believing. Keep on pursuing. Christian, I want you to begin looking at your losses in a different light because the loss defines your legacy. Each and every one of us only has a few moments in our lives that will determine how we're remembered. And oftentimes, they come at the most critical, crucial pain points of our lives. And how we respond to that pain, how we respond to that loss, how we respond to that circumstances will define the legacy that we leave behind. When we experience it, will we roll over and die? Or will we rise up in the strength of God? So I wanna ask you, are you in what appears to be a hopeless situation right now? Do you desperately need something from God, but it seems like you'll never have it? Do you feel like there's no future for you, that it's just too late for you? If so, then you need to approach God because even when there is no hope in the world, there is hope in Jesus. Even when there is no way, Jesus is the way. He will fill the void that you can't fill. He'll give you the life that you don't have. He'll bring you the joy that you can't find. And that is good news. Elijah was hoping for a different turn of events. Elijah expected a different story than the one that he was living. It seemed like revival had finally come to the land. It seemed like God had finally won. And he probably thought, man, we did it. The prophets of Baal are destroyed. I can kick back now. I can relax. Everything's going to work out. Hours earlier, the people were crying, the Lord, he is God. Now it's as though it was all for nothing. And this is where a lot of people have trouble with God. They grow impatient with him. When are you going to open the door for ministry to me, God? When are you gonna provide me with a husband or a wife? How long are you gonna let that person get away with sin or the way that they treat me at work? When are you gonna judge the world? When are you gonna come back? And in our impatience, we can sometimes take things into our own hands, can't we? And say, all right, God, if you're not gonna fix it, if you're not gonna do it, then I will. I'll fudge my standards. I'll date somebody who's not a believer. I'll get vengeance on that person at work. I'll deal with my promotion. I'll take things into my own hands. And we can actually end up like Jacob, making things worse. But Jesus doesn't ask us for our understanding of his ways and his timing. He asks for our trust. His delays are not necessarily his denials. Sometimes he doesn't give us what we ask for because he wants to give us something far better at a later time. The reason Jesus did this in his life and sometimes in ours is because he wants to do something greater than our expectations. He wants to teach us a lesson that we can only learn in the loss, that we can carry with us into the winds. Mary and Martha wanted healing, but God wanted to do better than that. He wanted a resurrection. Joseph wanted a place among his brothers, but God wanted to do better than that. He wanted to give him a place among the kings. The disciples wanted a lunch break. Jesus wanted to do better than that. He wanted a feast. Moses wanted a way around the sea, but God wanted to do better than that. He wanted to give him a way through the sea. The point is that even though we can't see how the situation will end or why it has come upon us, we can know 
that it flows from the love of God and is controlled by it. This is the meaning of all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. It's not a promise that bad things aren't gonna happen, but it's a promise that God can take the bad things that happen in your life. God can take the opposition. God can take the loss and he can turn it into a win for you. Maybe not a win in that situation. You might still come into that situation and say, that sucked, that hurt. I'm walking with a limp. I'm gonna walk from this situation hurt for the rest of my life. But he can use that situation to bring wins in your life later, to give you opportunities, to give you a platform, to give you a voice, to teach lessons to you that you were only able to learn there that you can carry in and help other people. That's what it means that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. So turn your L's into W's and stop the ops. Number two, mute the chat. I want you to look at verse five through 12 one more time. It says, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked there, by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. And an angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, and again, look at this, Elijah gives all the reasons for why he's running, all the reasons for why he's afraid. You know what it is as you read this? It's a tape that's playing in his mind, right? Have you ever had this happen to you? You're stuck in a situation and this tape is just playing over and over again in your head. And people tell you, hey, don't think about that. But every conversation just goes back to you replaying that tape. But you don't understand what happened and we wanna tell the story over and over again. And so Elijah, again, tells the story. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. It's a little accusatory, isn't it? I've been doing this for you, God. I've been having your back. No one else does, just me. And look what's happening to me now. They've forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He's given them all the reasons why. Then he said, the Lord, go out and stand on the mountain. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. We need to learn to mute the chat. Life's pain will always point to the Lord's promise. Proximity to the Lord always brings perspective. Remember what Psalm 23 says about the valleys? You are with me. Maybe you can't feel or see God's presence in the midst of the tape playing in your mind or in the midst of the wind or the earthquakes or the fires. Maybe you can't feel him, but it doesn't mean he's not there. God is there not because I feel him, not because I see him. He's there because he promised to be. And we just need to turn down the noise of the world and our minds and pause long enough to hear him speak. When you're playing video games, <laughs> back to that. When you're playing video games, sometimes you're, you're playing and you just wanna get that win, but you can't get the win because there's so many people in the chat because in these video games, there's people talking about do this, do that. You're hearing all the sounds of guns or you're hearing all the sounds of what's happening and it's so loud that you can't focus on what you're doing and the only way to get the win is to mute the chat. You just gotta turn all the sounds off because all the sounds are distracting you from your goals. I wanna read you this text in a really fun version that I found. Um, don't be offended by this. I actually did look at it and it is an accurate translation, uh, but because in spirit of the title and the points, I wanna read to you this text, verses five through 13 in the Gen Z version. It says, and while he was chilling, 
and taken a nap under a cool tree, suddenly an angel came and gently tapped him saying, yo, Elijah, wake up and grab a snack. So he checked it out and there was this epic cake cooking on the coals and a container of water right next to his swag. And he totally chowed down and drank then crashed out again, hashtag blessed. (laughs) Then the Lord's angel came back again, giving him a friendly tap and saying, dude, get up and grub. This journey is way too intense for you to handle on an empty stomach. Then he got up, had some grub and a drink, and journeyed for a solid 40 days and nights to Horeb, the lit mount of God. So Elijah went to his cave and decided to spend the night there, and surprise, surprise, God spoke to him and asked, why are you here, Elijah, what's up? So he said, yo, listen up, fam, I gotta keep it real with y'all. I've been mad protective of the big man upstairs, the Lord God of hosts. The Israelites straight up betrayed the promise they made with him, breaking altars and straight up murdering prophets. I'm telling you, I'm the last one holding it down for God. And now these peeps are after me trying to end my life. Then God was like, yo, go out and chill on that big mountain in front of me. And guess what? God showed up. (laughs) You know, I love this because there's a really practical concept to this. Elijah's freaking out. He's hearing the threats of Jezebel. They're playing in rewind in his head over and over again. All he's hearing is what's happening. All he's feeling is fear, anxiety, and doubts. And God basically tells Elijah, bro, Mute the chat. Stop listening to the threats of Jezebel. Stop listening to your internal voice of fear and depression. Stop looking at the scoreboard. Mute the chat so you can hear hear my still small voice. So what do I want you to do, Elijah? Go to that mountain. Get outside. Go touch grass, bro. Go get grounded. Go get out of your mind and look at nature and look what I've created, look what I've done. And notice the angel tells him a similar thing earlier. Elijah, chill out. Eat something, bro. You might just be hangry. Maybe you just need a Snickers bar. Maybe that's what's going on. And again, I love the practicality of scriptures because sometimes all we need to do is mute the chat. All we need to do is eat something. All we need to do is go outside and go for a walk so that we can listen to Jesus. I think it's funny, we always wanna hyper-spiritualize everything. And you'll talk to somebody like, man, will you please pray for me? I'm being attacked, there's all this spiritual warfare that's happening, I have so much anxiety. And yet when you really look into it, they just drink enough caffeine to kill a horse and they spend all day inside watching murder documentaries while they're scrolling on their cell phone. It's like, bro, there's nothing spiritual about that. You just need to go outside. (laughs) Go take a walk. Get out of the house. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop letting your mind operate on repeat. The reason you have anxiety, it might not be a spiritual attack. It might just be, you need to go eat something and go take a walk. Scripture tells us that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. When the people griped and complained about Moses' leadership in Exodus 15, 25, he cried unto the Lord. When Hezekiah received a threatening letter from the king who threatened his life, he spread it before the Lord. When John the Baptist was beheaded, his disciples went and told Jesus, Christian, I want you to know this, you don't serve a God who is disinterested in your life. You know, I love that God didn't correct Elijah. Elijah's like, hey, all this stuff's happening. I'm the only one holding it down for you. I'm the only one who trusts you. Everyone else is left and they're wanting to kill me. And God could have snapped at Elijah, right? Like, hey, Elijah, stop it. You're being whiny. Don't you know who I am? Didn't you see me work? Shut up. But he didn't. He's not like an angry parent at the end of his rope after a long day. God has mercy with him. Elijah vents, Elijah lets out what's going on and God says, Elijah, just go to that mountain and I'll talk to you. You can bring God your anxieties, you can bring God your cares, you can bring God your pain, you can vent to God and talk to God and get frustrated with God. Man, if you read the Psalms, you read some of the things that David said to God and you're like, can you say that? (laughs) I can't talk to my parents that way and you're talking to God like that? 
You can vent to God. You can let it off your chest. And God will be there to receive you. God will be there to hear you. God will be there to comfort you. He is compassionate. He is caring. He is concerned. He wants to help. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You know, most of us would like to avoid the L's, right? If, you, if I were to ask you, hey, if you have an option to just avoid all losses for the rest of your life, avoid all opposition, you don't have to stop the ops, they're just gone, would you say, yeah, sign me up for that, right? Most of us would love to just stop the losses, stop the opposition, preferring the cool waters and the green pastures. But when the heat gets turned up in your life, God has a way of speaking refreshing words over you. You can choose to melt under its force or you can rise to the occasion and be strengthened from it. So in the L's of life, the power and presence of Jesus Christ is with us in a special way. Now, how can we know when God is speaking to us and in what ways does he do it? I wanna give you three things. If you're in a season where you're doubting, you're in a season where you're having difficulty, that tape keeps running in your mind, three ways that you can get on a mountain and hear God. Number one, God speaks to us through his word. So often when someone says, I want God to speak to me, I want God to talk to me, my first question is, have you read the Bible? No. <laughs> Why not? It's the written word of God. Some of us are looking for an answer to our problems, but we haven't gone to the source of answers yet. And so we want God to speak to us, but we're not reading what he's already said to us. And obviously, God will never lead us to something contrary to his written word. So people will say, you know, I think God's calling me and my girlfriend to move in together. I'm like, no, he's not. No, he's not. Well, how do you know? Because he wouldn't do something that goes against his word, and he wants you to avoid all appearance of evil and not put yourself in a temptation. So I can tell you right now, God's not calling you to do that. So if you're hearing a voice, it's not God. God will never lead you into something that's contrary to his written word. This should be our litmus test, our bedrock, our absolute. And you wouldn't know this by the casual neglect of many believers. If you had a personal note from God that had the solution to every problem you ever had, would you wait until nothing else to do before you got around to it? No. You'd go into it, you'd dig into it, and you do, you have that. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Number two, God speaks through circumstances. Gideon is a classic example of this with his fleece laid out before the Lord. Remember that story? He lays out a fleece before the Lord. But keep in mind, those circumstances that you experience that God speaks to you through might also include failure. Remember, we already talked about the idea that God wants to use the losses in your life to reveal himself in a special way. So if you pray for God to reveal himself through circumstances, just know that might be painful circumstances that God wants to speak to you in. We're reminded of the story of Israel when they went against I. They decided to do it without any divine direction or strategy, and they miserably failed and eventually learned a very valuable lesson. So learn from your mistakes. Fail forward. Perhaps our failure today can make us a success tomorrow. Perhaps our loss yesterday is paving the way for a win tomorrow. And as a part of this, God speaks to us through people. There's countless stories in the Bible of God speaking to people through people. And then finally, God speaks to us by his peace. And that's what we see here in the text. Can I just tell you, this is my favorite. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Or literally, let the peace of God as an umpire settle with all finality all matters that arise in your heart. Isn't that beautiful? Let the peace of God settle all matters that arise in your heart. And I found this principle of just go to a mountain to be so true in my walk with God. I find when I'm really struggling, when I'm really going through something, the best thing for me to do is just take a walk by myself and not even think about the problems. Turn that tape off and just sing praises sing songs to God, just talk to God and tell him how much I love him, how thankful I am for him, how holy he is, how powerful he is. And as I do that, the peace of God begins to flood into your life like living waters. And it settles with finality all the situations that you face. 
the peace of God reigns. It's through these channels that I hear that still, small voice. I wanna ask you a closing question. Is God speaking to you right now? Don't harden your heart if you can hear his voice. Now, what exactly did God say to this discouraged prophet who was feeling sorry for himself? I love it. Look at verse 13. We haven't read it yet. We'll close with this. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? You know, the same question could be asked to many of us today, to Peter warming himself at the fire of the enemies. Jesus could have asked, Peter, what are you doing here? To Samson with his head in the lap of Delilah, who had openly told him she wanted to know the secret of his strength so she could torment him. God could have said, Samson, what are you doing here? To the young boy, the prodigal, who had left the safety and security of his father's house and found himself empty and lonely with a bunch of pigs, he could have said, hey, what are you doing here? And to some of us right now, have you ever sensed the conviction of the Holy Spirit when you were in a relationship or a place that you didn't belong? You're in a movie theater and a scene comes on where the Lord is mocked and laughed at. You feel that tinge? Why am I here? You're in a parked car with some person and sexual passion is spreading over you like wildfire. And you get that brief moment, what am I doing here? I shouldn't be here or you're in a relationship or a friendship that is spiritually draining you and dragging you down, or you're doing your taxes and you're tempted to just fudge those numbers a little bit, <laughs> what are you doing here? One thing is clear in scripture, God speaks to his children. To some like Moses, he spoke audibly. To others like Elijah, he spoke quietly. Jesus said when standing before Pilate, everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. In John 10, he said, his sheep hear, know, and follow his voice. I think one reason that we don't hear God's voice is we're not listening. We need to mute the chat. We need to listen. Is God speaking to you right now? Is God wanting to tell you something in a season of life that you're going through? Maybe you're hearing his still small voice. Maybe he's been speaking to you through your friends. Maybe he's been speaking to you lately through your circumstances. Maybe he's been speaking to you through your quiet times and the word of God. Maybe he's been speaking to you and you just need to mute the chat so that you can hear him finally. Don't ask God to change your circumstances. Ask God to change you no matter what your circumstances are. Turn your L's into W's regardless of how things turn out because the win doesn't come from the outcome. The win comes from knowing the Lord is with you. Remember scripture tells us to cast all our cares upon him for he cares for you or as King Jehoshaphat prayed, we don't know what to do, Lord, but our eyes are upon you. Hosea 10, 12, and I'll close with this, says it is time to seek the Lord. So church, can we commit to seeking the Lord? Can we commit to whatever situation we're in, even when it looks like a loss, even when it looks like there's no way out of it, to have trust that God can do something with it? to trust and believe that he is working all things together for the good of those who call upon his name. So whatever your opposition is, if it's the devil, if it's temptation, if it's yourself, if it's fear, if it's doubt, if it's depression, and that taste just running in your mind over and over and over again, that you're gonna stop the opposition, that you're gonna mute the chat, and you're gonna finally come and say, Lord, speak to me. Bring me your peace. And so Lord, we do that here in this moment, in this place. We take a moment, Lord, and just silence ourselves. I don't know what everyone's week has been like in this room. I don't know what everyone's month has been like, what their year has been like. Those watching online, those who are at our campuses, Lord, so many people around the globe. And I recognize that with all those people, 
There's a lot of wins and there's a lot of losses. And some of us might be here in this moment feeling burdened, feeling weighed down just like Elijah did, running and running and running. The tape playing in our head, the threats of the world, the fear, the anxiety. And Lord, you brought us here in this moment to just say, stop, stop it. Go to that mountain and I'll talk to you. So Lord, here in this mountaintop experience, we ask you would speak to us in a still small voice. And I recognize one of the things that God speaks to us as we're praying, actually the first thing that God speaks to us is he draws us to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, if you hear this and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I wanna let you know this peace of God that surpasses all understanding, this still small voice, this comfort, this joy, all things working together for good, it's only available to those who call upon the name of the Lord. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're just running. You're just running. You're trying all these things in the world to fix your pain, to fix your anxiety, to fix your situations, but it never works out. You get to the end of your rope and you just feel more empty, more alone, more sad. You need to try something new. If you're feeling that way, you feel like you've tried so hard to make yourself happy and it hasn't worked, you need to let Jesus do that job. He's gonna do a way better job than you ever could. He'll turn your tears into laughter. He'll turn your mourning into dancing. He'll turn your weeks into years. He'll exchange your death for life and all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. So if that's you and you're in here, you're watching online, you're here in room, you're at one of our campuses, if you're right now willing to admit, I need help, I can't do this on my own, I need Jesus to come into my life to give me a joy that will be there tomorrow. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up and say, Nate, pray for me. I wanna give my life to Jesus, amen. I see your hand in the back, just raise it up high, like you're reaching out for a life preserver. You're saying, I need help. I need Jesus in my life. I wanna be forgiven of my sin. I wanna have joy. Anyone else, just raise up your hand. If God's speaking to you right now, up in the balcony, I see your hand, a couple of you. Anyone else, just raise it up. If I don't see it, wave at me. Well, Lord, I thank you for these in this room who have raised their hand up, acknowledging their need for you. And if that's you right now where you're sitting, will you just pray this prayer out loud after me? Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know that I've done so many things that have hurt you. But Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for those things. And I believe that you rose from the dead. So Lord, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I turn from my old life and I turn to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me joy. Give me satisfaction. Give me peace and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can we give a round of applause for all those amen. who just said that prayer in person and online? If you're online and you said that prayer, we would love to follow up with you. You can just text the word LIFE, L-I-F-E, to 505-509-5433, or you can let someone in the chat know that you just prayed that prayer. For those of you who are in person, if you prayed that prayer, don't leave. After the service, we would love to talk to you. We'd love to encourage you, and we'd love to help follow up and take the next step with the Lord. So we're gonna have some uh, counselors up here in the front, some pastors, just let someone know, hey, I prayed that prayer. God bless you guys. We love you. I hope you experience the peace of God this week. Next week, we're in adulting. Here's Janae. Amen. Thank you, guys. If it was your first time with us at Calvary this evening, we would love for you to fill out this next red step card. And that is so that we can get connected with, with you. We'd love to give um, a donation to one of the ministries that are listed on the card. We'd love to help you find your next step and find a way to get plugged in here. So 
keep in mind, do that. If you also made a decision for, the, for Christ, you can also fill out that form because again, we wanna connect with you and help you take those next steps in your faith. But before we go, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this beautiful evening. We thank you for your word that never returns void. We pray, Lord, that it would penetrate our hearts and help us to live a life for you. Help us to see you in every circumstance. Lord, whether it's a win or a loss, Lord, may we lean on you and know that you have a greater plan for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a wonderful weekend.